On August the 20th, 1999, an incident occurred in an isolated Norfolk farmhouse that would divide the British public. When criminals broke into the home of Tony Martin, he found himself in a situation that every householder fears. Should he stay in his bedroom or confront the burglars? What happened next would change the lives of the people involved forever. It would lead to one of the most controversial trials in legal history, questions in the House of Commons and calls for a change in the law. Tony Martin was given a life sentence for killing an intruder even though the law allows householders to use reasonable force to prevent a burglary. So how could a British jury find Tony Martin guilty of murder? If you think you're living in a safe country today, in a law-abiding country, and the state is now looking after you, you can forget about it. They can't look after you, or they won't look after you. I'm not sure which, but uh, what happened to me down at Bleak House shouldn't have happened in the first place. In the summer of 1999, it seemed to residents of West Norfolk that the Fenlands had become a magnet for criminals. If we look at the period around 1999, when the Martin Affair happened, the police had been given very specific targets from the government to combat house burglary. And if you look statistically, all those crimes um, were happening in the towns with a few in the countryside. So it was obvious to the police commanders, I guess, to put the majority of the policemen in the towns, thereby rapidly making a reduction in the, the target figures. Uh, unfortunately, that leaves the countryside unguarded. We used to have our own policemen, always had village bobbies. You didn't even ride your bike without your lights on at night because you knew somewhere or other that policeman was going to be, and there wasn't crime then. It's not the same in this day and age. We've had three burglaries and a lot of my neighbours have been broken into. It's, um, it's hard on the people that it happens to. The trust in the police in this area in particular had gone very, very much downhill. Very serious crimes were happening and not being dealt with. This is the very thing that leads to people taking the law into their own hands, a thing that might be appropriate in the times of the Wild West, but we certainly don't want in the wilder west of Norfolk. The rising levels of crime and the perceived lack of response from the police had caused a great deal of concern in the community and in one Norfolk farmer in particular. 54-year-old Tony Martin. Just a farmer. Toil the land, prune trees in the autumn, wait for the spring to come, do what is necessary to keep the crops in good order. Harvest time comes, and then the whole cycle goes round again. I think he's a genuine sort of fellow. And, as I say, he keeps himself to himself and gets on with his job and away he goes. Tony would start farming when everybody else had gone to bed. You'd, you'd see him about midnight riding up and down in his tractor. But then, having said that, it's his life. He can do what he wants, can't he, as long as he don't hurt anybody else. Tony's just an old country boy. He's, yeah, he is eccentric, but then you go to any village and 
everybody's got a Tony Martin. Like most farmers in the area, Tony Martin had been the victim of numerous petty thefts. An incident in May 1999 affected him particularly badly. We knew he'd been burgled because Paul found um, some of Tony's belongings scattered over a field on one of their, their farmlands. I didn't know it was Tony Stubstow, I just picked the tape up and I thought I'll play the tape in my tractor. And uh, that was, I thought, well, that's Tony's voice on there. He was very upset when I gave him that. Somebody would be in my house. And it was a very strange sensation because I knew somebody had been in there and I found that quite devastating and I found it very difficult to live with myself and it, it, it spoils your way of life, you, you don't enjoy your work and uh, you just don't know what's going to happen next. When you have your house broken and you become devastated, you actually, you do feel slightly suicidal. And he's always said if he caught anybody on his property, he'd shoot them. Seventy miles away was the home of 16-year-old Fred Barris. Brought up by his mother and five elder sisters, Barris left school at 14. By 1999, he had already been convicted of 29 offences, including assault, theft, burglary and shoplifting. Fred used to babysit for me children. If he wanted to take me girlfriend out, take her for a drink or a meal and whatever it is, he used to come babysit for me. He'd always talk to everyone. I've got to know him that way and I know his mum. Freddie, what are you doing? Here's your dinner. You going out? Yeah. Where are you going? Going around Brandon. Well, don't be back late, eh? Yeah, all right. Here's Mum. Basically, he's a happy go lucky lad. Everyone who knows Fred would describe him like that, and the people he's probably knocked on the door and terrorised, obviously they won't, <laughs> but people in know him would. Brendan Fearon grew up on the same Nottinghamshire estate as Fred Barris. By age 30, he was well known to the police as a professional fence and occasional housebreaker. Five years ago, he was a 30. I was 30, he was a looking for work. Having my kids, a just everyday thing, basically. He was a doing my flat up. Then a doing people the odd favours is, I was into antiques at the time I was, is. Fearon's interest in antiques consisted of stealing and handling them for others. By August 1999, he'd already served two prison sentences and had 33 convictions, including assault, theft and burglary. Well, I've done burglaries in, in my time now, I've very... When I was younger, I used to do silly things, buying and selling the odd bit of antiques. would keep myself busy, basically. At 6.30 on August the 20th, 1999, Fearon left home to meet his friend and fellow criminal, 34-year-old Darren Bark. With 52 convictions, Bark was a full-time crook who stole for a living. I met him in prison and he was one of these... Uh, Every time he's met somebody, he'd uh, rub them all the wrong way, he would uh, so, or rub them all in prison, whatever, so there's a few people after him, this and that, and because he was from my hometown, I watched his bag, he's, uh, a few people knew me, so you know, if I said, look, leave him, from my town, he'd leave him, and, and from there I met him outside and whatever he's. Bark had been planning the farmhouse raid for some time and invited Fearon because of his expertise in antiques. Fearon claims Fred Barris was a last-minute addition to the evening's activities. He was asking me, can he come round? I said, well, I'm going out, I'm doing somebody a favour, I'm going for a ride. And he was saying, well, can I have a ride, can I have a ride? So I've asked the driver, look, can I pick somebody up, keep him out of trouble, he'll be all right, he'll be in the bag, you're not even there, he's there. Yeah. I think he looked up to me. 
Nice car you got here. Eh? <laughs> so stop taking a piss out of me. No, yeah, no, you weren't taking a piss out of me as much as I was. Have you got a car? Have you got a car? No, I've got a car. Can you drive? Yeah, I can drive, but I've not got a license. I can drive, what are you talking about? At seven o'clock, the men set off on the 70-mile journey to Tony Martin's farm. It was the first time they had cooperated together on a job. Darren's already been to this farm before and robbed him. He's a farmer, he's an old nutter, he's a nutcase. He knows that these dogs are here, and apparently Tony Martin don't live there. Trust me, I'm <laughs> telling you, trust me, he don't, he don't live there, I won't be taking you there if you live there, would he? The only thing he had to worry about is the dogs, but... Well, no, you don't even have to worry about the dogs, really. There's just a couple of dogs here, but it's a farm. We make noise, yeah, it doesn't matter if we make a bit of noise. You're talking about making noise, you're a burglar. What do you want to make noise for? Oh, I'm saying is he all right? <laughs> is he all right? Oh, yeah, sure. Up. Yeah. All right, sure, all right. because... No, I'm getting pissed off now. You say he's not in the house, and what's the problem? The criminal's journey from Newark to Tony Martin's house took them through three different counties. What was happening, particularly at that time, we were getting a lot of visitations from the area where Fearon and his friends came from, the Nottinghamshire area, travelling down and coming into this area and doing burglaries and then going back home again. And at that stage, it was very difficult for the police to get their heads around that, I think, and deal with it appropriately. Simply because the three police forces that they were crossing through weren't really cooperating with each other at all. And when it came down to trying to communicate, they found their IT systems and their radio systems wouldn't work with each other. So they couldn't effectively communicate. If you're doing a crime, it would pay you to do it on a, an area where there is a police boundary. It was why this pattern of cross-border was going on and why Tony Martin and others had had so many burglaries. But unlike the other farmers in the area, Tony Martin had a history of hitting back at intruders. In 1994, an incident on his farm landed him in trouble with the police. Come on, here we are. I caught a man on my farm. I saw somebody and I thought it was very odd, his behaviour. I went to see him. I was quite polite, asked him who he was. And he wouldn't tell me, so I asked him to leave. He was very rude to me. He made threats about my dog to kill them. He did go away, he did come back, he did try and kill him. And at that stage, I had gone and got a gun. I actually watched him had three attempts at trying to kill these dogs. After the third attempt, I thought, well, he's obviously not going to stop. Anyway, I fired at the back of the vehicle, and uh, suddenly this man suddenly got in the real world, and off he went. Anyway, they took my gun licence away. Had I gone to court to apply for my gun licence back then, I had to give it back, because I actually didn't do anything wrong. I mean, if you think it's wrong to fire at somebody's vehicle, a back wheel, not just at a vehicle, it was an aim shot at the back um, wheel. Um, I did that because I didn't want this man to run my dogs over. Or should you allow somebody to run your dogs over? Anyway, that's how that was then. Fear and Bark and Barris took a leisurely route to what they thought would be an empty farmhouse and an easy burglary. They had no idea their plans would have catastrophic consequences. Or that the catastrophe might have been avoided. A local police officer was on a routine patrol when he spotted the burglars. Three men had 113 convictions between them and a burglar's toolkit in the boot of their car. I'm joking, it's alright, don't panic. Fred. Shut up. Hello, gents. How's it going? Where are you off to? Uh, we're just on the way home. Just on the way home at the moment. Got any idea on you? Uh, no, my wallet's at home with my driver's license. I've got my insurance document there. And you're Darren, are you? That's right. If the officer had searched their vehicle, 
or check their criminal records, he could have detained them on suspicion of conspiracy to burgle. What's your current address, Dan? Yeah. I'm gonna give you a ticket right. to produce your driving license from your MOT. All right, at yeah. At your local Nick within seven days. All right, mate. The police took all his details and both his normal routine. The thing out of it is, I want driving. If he didn't he have his licence and that, it's down to him. He said, but he did, he had all the papers and everything, so didn't think out of it. Then we just went on our way. Drive safely. Will do. The police officer had no reason to detain them and the criminals were free to continue their journey. They made their way across the Norfolk border to an isolated farm called Bleak House. There are just two surviving witnesses to the events that followed, and each of them tells a very different story. So what happened at 9.30 that evening depends on who you believe, the householder or the burglar. Tony Martin's story is of a man who was surprised by intruders and was forced to act in self-defence. I was just in a very dark room because I only had a little tiny side light on, just enough to read. When I finish the day, I get upstairs can't be bothered to have a bath because I don't like bathing too often because it saps your energy. And I just like to read a magazine and you read half of it and then you go to sleep. Simple as that. That's, that's what happened that night. The same thing again as usual. I'd just been reading The Farmers Weekly. And as I do, you get halfway through and you nod off. I didn't know anybody was in that house till I heard a window smash. I then decided, you can't just lay there. So I got up, went to the landing. I heard people downstairs, there's no two ways about that. And that put the fear of life into me. And with the sheer fear, I eventually decided it was best to protect myself. So I went back in the bedroom and I picked up the gun. I've never ever used that gun till that night. I wouldn't even know to this day where that safety switch is on that gun. I thought about what was the next move. I mean, when a person breaks in your house, they have a choice. You don't have a choice. The only choices you have are put upon you, they're forced upon you. And uh, which way you're gonna go is depends on your makeup, your experiences. Personally, I couldn't stay in the bedroom anymore. I went down the staircase, tried to understand what was happening. It may be your house, but when somebody else is in it, you don't know what they're doing. I could hear this terrific boom, 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 boom. Now, whether you imagine it or whether it really is happening, I don't know, but I can assure you I was petrified. Then <laughs> suddenly this bright light was put upon me. Basically, you're under attack at that stage. I'm not paranoid or hypersensitive, but I know what people do, and a lot of people think nothing of picking a brick up and... Um, smashing it over over your head. So all these things in a very brief seconds or trillionth of a second, all these things come to mind. And that's what basically um, triggered me to pull the trigger, basically. Sorry about the pun, but uh, that's how it is. It's pressure. Something happens to you. 
Once you pull the trigger, you don't stop. This is adrenaline, and I really can't tell you any more than that, and I think that's what happened to me that night. I turned around, went back up the stairs, and um, the rest is history, really. But history is open to interpretation. Burglar Brendan Fearon claims Tony Martin was not acting in self-defense. He says Martin must have heard them arrive and deliberately ambushed them. I've got no reason to lie whatsoever. I uh, can't gain nothing or lose nothing from lying. But short of uh, Tony Martin, he can because he's, he was in wait. Darren has pulled up and he's pointed and said, look, nobody's lived there hundred years. It's an empty place. So I've got out of the car, I've got gloves on, so I don't get a prints on the window. Keep them on. Yeah. Yeah. Bag, a torch. All right, lad. Brendan Fearon disputes Tony Martin's claim that he was asleep when they entered the house. Fearon says an encounter with Martin's dogs outside would have been loud enough to alert anyone. Next thing you know, he was a lot while there. Shit! Shit! Good dog. So I'm like walking back, and Fred's uh, hanging on to me. I'm walking back and back and back. He just kept snapping at me with froth on his mouth. As the dog was making a lot of noise with us, and he's making noise outside with his fall in the dog chasing us, he would have been watching everything. I'm thinking, well, it's only one dog, pat it, and they, they, all dogs are nice if you're nice to them and you don't show no fear. Tony Martin could have found the police there and then this is like, he's intruded in my garden and whatever, but now he's come down and, and shot us. He's downstairs, even before we've managed to get in the place. Bloody hell. Oh, it took a bit of time to get the window open. All of a sudden, they stood there and felt a load of a uh, rubble and these cans of food and beans and all sorts, all that was scattered on the floor. Like a, I don't know, squatters would live in the place. Hey, some of everything they have ate was dropped on the floor. I know I was not very steady on my feet. This shit in here. Oh, fucking nutter. Contrary to Tony Martin's claim that a torch was shone in his face, Fearon says he didn't realise someone else was in the house until he heard the first shot. And the minute I go in the place, all of a sudden, bang, bang, bang. Ah! And then the flashing lights. Ah! Then it went jet black. Ah! I'd say seconds of getting in the ass, so... Ten seconds, getting in the ass and him shooting from the minute I've got in the ass is ten seconds. I didn't know I was shot. So the pain I was feeling, I didn't know it was a shotgun. Fred's holding me all the time, holding him on my shoulder. I heard him shout out to hey, mum. And it is a so obviously that's his comfort point, his his mum. <laughs> then I'm going mad, I'm just punching walls and trying to go for the window. <laughs> Pulled the window out. Fell in a, a little drill. Uh, uh, 
shouted Fred, aid him. Shouted him again, aid him. Shouted him again, didn't aid him. I fell down on a dike, then they must have passed out. But I didn't see him after that. With Fearon unconscious and Tony Martin upstairs, the only other potential witness had already left the scene. At the time of the shooting, Darren Bark was keeping watch at the bottom of the lane, waiting for Fearon to call him back to pick up the loot. Realising that Fearon had forgotten his phone and sensing something was wrong, Bark fled. Tony Martin was now upstairs, alone, in Bleak House. And I thought, well, you can't lay here, because you don't know what's happened, you don't know who's running around. You get somebody, somebody slip back in up the stairs and in your bedroom. So then I went downstairs... I had a good look round the property and I couldn't see anybody about at all. I mean, there was nothing obvious that anybody had been shot. There was no obvious blood. There may have been blood around. I see the window was missing and I see these two holders on the ground. I thought, this is interesting. Got two holders here. Somebody's come prepared. I basically went out of the house and drove down the driveway and of course we all know now i didn't realize it but somebody was actually laying in my border of my garden tony lives um just through the trees opposite his house is right in the center of those trees and we'd just got home from shopping. It was about nine o'clock on a Friday night and um, we were just unloading the shopping and Tony drew up out the front there, so Paul went out to speak to him. Tony was his normal self. he come round, and so I met him outside and he told me what he'd done. I popped in to see Paul and... Um, I, I told him that I had somebody break in my house and I fired the gun. As he said, I took a shot at him, but he said, I don't want to hit him. And I said, well, I think, Tony, you've got to phone the police. Well, with saying that, he got in his car and went back to his house. I did actually say to Paul at one time, well, do you think we ought to ring the police? And then we said, well... You know, is Tony exaggerating? If somebody had shot at you, you weren't going to hang around anyway, so they'd be miles long gone then. So we just didn't think anything more of it. Some people said you should have rung the police, but I couldn't see any point in ringing the police because I did pick up the phone and I thought about it and then I put it down again. This was after shooting because I... Didn't know what had happened. It was quite apparent there was nobody in the house. And I thought, well, what's the point of ringing the police? Because you're going to have to tell them you've just had a break-in and you've used a gun. And then, of course, if they check, they'll find out you haven't got a gun licence. So I thought, well, uh, that's a bit dodgy. Then I thought, well, I don't know what to do here. I couldn't go back in the house. didn't like that idea. So I thought I'd go and see my mother. I had to wake her up because she'd gone to bed because she likes going to bed early. So I sat there in the evening drinking coffee. So I left the gun at my mother's house. And that's all I can really tell you. It's as simple as that, really. wondering where I'm at. I'm not sure which is the way to get out, which is the sky, is the sky left, right, up, and 
I remember feeling the pain from my leg. <laughs> and I put my hand to my leg again and seen a big hole. <laughs> yeah, the pain was immense pain. <laughs> The more pain I'm in, the more uh, adrenaline kicks in. And I just stood up on my leg, kept falling. And all my body went, and I was going in zigzags. I've ended up seeing a light. And for a while, I led towards that light. It seemed to take me hours. It could have been a minute. It could have been 20 minutes, it's an hour. It seemed like a long time. Tony had been gone about two hours. It was about 11 o'clock at night and I came into the kitchen. Paul had gone into the bathroom to get ready for bed. I'd come into the kitchen to put some cups in the sink and I heard this moaning and it was coming from the direction of the hedge over there <clears throat> and there was suddenly a a head coming above the hedge very, very slowly and it came to where the gate is and I could see this man dragging himself up to where our window is. I'm walking towards this house where I could see the lights. I've ended up standing at the man's drive or the lady's drive to be ready to pass out and I thought I could make it to the window and up making it to the window banging on the window and my in. When when he actually dragged himself up to my window, that was really, really scary. I mean, feeling very, very vulnerable because if this was one of the burglars that Tony had shot at, where are the other two? Where's Tony with his gun? Are these two other burglars looking for this one? Are they armed? When I see Farron come in the gate, I told the wife to phone the police then, because I put two and two together and thought, yeah, Tony, you did shoot him. <clears throat> and the police said not to go outside to wait until the police car arrived. But at that point, Paul said, well, I've got to go outside because otherwise he's going to be dead. And I wouldn't say I was frightened, but you just got that feeling that he might have a knife or this gun or whatever. But once I was outside, I, I wasn't too bad. And he covered him with a blanket and he spoke to him and asked him if there was anybody else hurt anywhere and he said no. The last that Fearon heard of Fred Barris was a muffled cry after the shooting. Even when taken to hospital, Fearon maintained the criminal's code of silence and insisted he'd been acting alone. Why well, should I involve somebody else? Is my uh, thinking, well, I've took Fred, I've done enough damage in my view, eh? but I don't want to mention anybody else's name, which is a silly thing. It is, but you don't, don't dub other people in, you don't. If I do something like that, I feel like a low life I do, and I can't do things like that. I can't do mention people's names and just the way I am. At 1.20 a.m., Darren Bark returned to look for his friends and was picked up by the police. But he, too, failed to tell them there were three burglars out that night. By this time, Tony Martin had left his mother's and driven to the Marmion House Hotel in nearby Wisbeach, owned by his friend of 20 years, Helen Lilly. Well, Mrs Lilly's hotel went round there. I mean, everybody knows I go round there. And uh, I just stayed there the night. Needless to say, I didn't get much sleep that night. I can't remember whether I did sleep or not. But um, just laid on the, um, on the sofa. With Tony Martin asleep, Fearon in hospital and Bark in custody. Still, no one had revealed to the police that a 16-year-old boy was lying in the grounds of Bleak House. During the night, doctors operated on Brendan Fearon. 
It was only when he regained consciousness that he learned the extent of his wounds. I got shot in the right leg, at the top of the leg, then in the left, just above my knee. And so I've been told, hold several pellets in my groin, but this is just what I was told. He said we took some out of your groin. I think it was 11 pellets. At 7 a.m., the police spotted Martin's car outside the Marmion House Hotel and picked him up for questioning. It was only till I got to Kings Lynn Police Station they decided to make a statement and then one of the CID men then said, well, we've been talking to somebody. I thought, oh, well, right, they caught somebody. And he said he's under sedation and uh, then this thing started to get a bit clearer and uh, obviously somebody had been shot. Martin explained that he had acted in self-defence, but Fearon had already claimed it was an unprovoked attack. All the police knew for sure was that Fearon had been shot on Martin's property, so Bleak House became the focus of their attention. The Rottweilers were still loose in the grounds, so just before midday, the police asked Tony Martin's friend, Roger Putterell, to round them up. Here, boy! was found dead with a shotgun wound in his back. The case became a murder investigation. They then suddenly came in and said, we have just found a, a, um, a body in, in your garden and we're now charging you with murder. Uh, do, you, do you understand that? And I thought at this stage, I really don't understand anything. I, th I thought it was absolute madness. It's like a, a surreal world. Here, a farmer has been charged with murdering a 16-year-old suspected burglar at his home in Norfolk. 54-year-old Tony Martin lived on his own on his 350-acre farm. The police were called to his home at just before midnight on Friday, but it was a further 12 hours before they found the body of 16-year-old Fred Barris. Then I was in the hospital bed, had uh, my family and that, the come. And my mother said, look, Fred say, Fred's dead, he died, he's got shot in the back and this and that. Then, then my eyes started streaming. I just didn't want nobody around me, and from there, I think depression kicked in. If I never took him, obviously none of this would have happened. He's always smiling, always cheerful, always help anybody. He won't a, a, a bad lad, he won't. He's just a good hearty little lad, he was. He's, he would have grown up to be, be a nice man, he would. And I kept feeling guilty because I kept thinking if we'd have found the place when Tony first come round, would that boy have still lived? But then fear and if he'd have been honest and he'd have said that he was there and he was injured he could have saved his life but all he was worried about was his own skin pathologists reports concluded that fred barris was shot in the back from approximately 10 feet away and that if medics had reached him within half an hour he might have survived Now, in the trial of the Norfolk farmer accused of murder and attempt... Tony Martin's trial in April 2000 was one of the most contentious in British legal history. His defense, his counsel and his... It seemed outrageous to many people that the victim of a burglary was being prosecuted. Did he use reasonable force? The Norfolk farmer broke down in court today as he talked of his terror. Tony Martin said it was like being in a horror movie. He said a light was shone in his face. He said, I felt blinded, terrified and vulnerable. But the prosecution counsel, Rosamund Hallwood, 
Howard Smart said to Tony Martin, you're telling lies. How have the prosecution described uh, the farmer Tony Martin, Richard? Well, they described him as an eccentric living in a, a near desolate farmhouse. He'd booby-trapped the steps to his house, he'd put bars on the inside, he lived in near darkness. You were already downstairs, you went behind the two men and shot them like rats in a trap. Mr. Martin told the police that if the burglars return, he'd blow their heads off. He also said that he'd like to get gypsies rounded up into a field and machine gun them down. After seven days in court, the jury reached their verdict. Tony Martin was taken away to start his life sentence after the jury decided he was guilty of murdering an intruder. The jury did not believe that Martin used reasonable force in self-defense. Instead, they believed Fearon's story, that Martin's actions were premeditated murder. So why did they side with the burglar and not the homeowner? The, the trouble when you've got witnesses like Fearon, he's a man with um, a, a lot of previous convictions. So you start by saying, well, wait a minute, uh, is he a very reliable character? Then you look to see what may support it. And in this case, it was possible to corroborate some of Fearon's evidence. First of all, there was evidence from a number of ordinary people who had remembered what Tony Martin had said at various meetings. Three people testified in court about Tony Martin's attitude to burglars. One of them was ex-policeman Tony Bone, who runs Farm Watch, an organisation dedicated to tackling rural crime. I was an armed response officer within Norfolk and as such received a lot of training, a very good training on psychology of people and uh, their attitudes, body language, etc. I first met Tony at, at a farm watch meeting. We held it in a, a local hall. Uh, There's about 35 people turned up. There were still people very disgruntled about the levels of crime, the lack of apparent police response to it, and Tony was one of the people that turned up. He sat at the back in a little woolly hat and uh, he started giving me what I would best describe as a bit of heckling. Eventually I did say to him, well, how would you deal with these people? And uh, his reply was that he thought that he would shoot them. I was disturbed, to say the least, when I heard him say that. My own feelings were that here was a man that was actually capable of carrying out what he was saying. Um, I went away from that meeting still feeling concerned about him and actually contacted the police with regard to him and was reassured to hear that he wasn't uh, a licensed firearm holder. But Martin did have a gun. Despite having his licence confiscated in 1994 for shooting at a trespasser, by the time of the incident in Bleak House, Martin had acquired a new illegal weapon. A Winchester pump action like that, you would normally only find that used these days as a riot gun. It's something to use to, when you're in a desperate situation, to control large numbers of people. It's always been described to me as a firearms operative as the most deadly short-range weapon in the world, which it is. It will blow a very large hole in you at short range. It's not something to be messed with, not something to be fired uh, without very good reason indeed. It's not the thing that a normal person would expect to have in their armory, or should have. It was a pump-action type shotgun, um, the type that got banned after the Hungerford Massacre. Um, and secondly, where did it come from? And the only explanation he could give was that he found it in the back of his car, which is not very helpful. No idea where it came from. I found it in the car, in my garage on a Saturday morning. I say it, it's a strange... Things do happen around my house on a Saturday morning for some unknown reason. And there it was, and that's all there is to it. He couldn't adequately explain where the gun or the cartridges had come from. It was all shrouded in mystery. Uh, he needed to be honest with the court, and that didn't, to my mind, come across as that way at all. The prosecution argued that Martin kept the gun specifically for shooting burglars. 
and that his actions in Bleak House demonstrated a murderous intent. It was much criticised at the trial for not having a warning shout. And it was said to him, well, you didn't shout, get out, or anything like that at all. And he could have been a child. Well, he turned out to be a lad of 16, but he could have been a child fooling around in there. And he was much criticised for that. That was a big point the prosecution made. But normally speaking, you'd expect an ordinary man to shout a warning. Get out. I remember somebody said that I was wrong and because I crept down the stairs. Is there anything wrong with um, creeping down the stairs? Because do you let people know you're on the stairs? Do you? Do you let people know you're on the stairs? Do you let people know where you are at all? He's got a gun in his hand. Regardless what we've got on us, he can see us coming. He can hear me. I mean, when he could have, so what are you doing all shot outside at us if he wanted to? But he waited for it to come in the house. That's for, for him to shoot us. Is. The issue at the heart of the case was whether Tony Martin used reasonable force when he shot the intruders. Martin claimed he was on the stairs when a torch shone in his eyes caused him to fire in self-defense. But Fearon denies his torch dazzled Martin. He says the farmer just opened fire. While it could have been a case of one man's word against the other, the ballistic evidence was clear. Freddie Mead is one of Britain's leading ballistic experts and has reviewed the evidence from Martin's trial. What I did was I went back to, this, uh, to the farmhouse and I looked at the stairs and the, the general layout. Mr Martin's explanation was that he had fired all three shots from the stairs. On the far wall of this particular broom, near the door and the windows, there were pellet marks on the wall. And it was possible to see from these pellet marks that the pellets were more or less horizontal to the ground, perhaps with a downward incline, but their line was such that if you looked from them back to the doorway, then you couldn't see the stairs. The pellets would have had to go around a corner, so to speak, which they're not going to do. And so in order for those shots to have hit the wall, then those shots must have been fired from within the room. It's impossible to shoot from where he said he shot from, because um, he'd be shooting around a corner. And what's the point of lying? Is uh, if you've got nothing to hide. I know I was in the staircase. I remember when the torch was put upon me. Although Martin remembers firing all the shots in a panic from the staircase, further ballistic evidence suggested this was impossible. Just inside the doorway of the room at the bottom of the stairs, there were three fired cartridge cases found. And that was inconsistent with three shots from the stairs. However, it wasn't inconsistent with a shot having been fired from the stairs, Mr. Martin then descending to the ground floor level, recycling the action of the gun and firing two further shots. The prosecution argued that the pellet marks and the cartridge cases could mean only one thing. Martin may have fired his first shot from the stairs in self-defense, but he must then have walked down the stairs into the room and fired twice more. So it meant that he had advanced. Then you added to that the fact that the boy who was shot was shot in the back, which is obviously going in the opposite direction, and every pellet had gone through his body. So that altogether fixed a pattern. And one can see a jury might say, well, on the basis of that, I can, I'm sure, I'm beyond reasonable doubt, that he came down and fired those shots pretty quickly, no warning. And uh, the deceased boy was, in fact, going away from him at the time. The prosecution went on to scrutinise Martin's behaviour in the aftermath of the shooting. Having fired three times at close range, Martin returned to his bedroom. He would later claim that he didn't realise anyone had been hurt. Oh, he's heard screaming and what have you. He's heard Fred shout, Mum, and scream, and no doubt I've shouted. 
going to... I don't think you could have thought that they'd run away. I don't, I don't think that at all. People said you must have heard this and that. That house was so quiet, it was unbelievable. It is possible that Tony Martin heard nothing because he was temporarily deafened by the sound of the gunshots. The sound of a shot being fired in that room would have been very loud indeed, and of course there being no furniture to absorb it, uh, it would have been deafening and might well have been painful. It must have been extremely noisy when he fired the shotgun in, in the premises, because it was a fairly small room, I quite accept that. Um, but it would still have made him think, perhaps I've hit somebody. Then he doesn't behave like an innocent man because he goes away from the house and he takes the gun to his mother's and hides it there. Now, why bother to do all that if, in fact, you were not aware that something terrible had happened? Though that's unusual. Normally, when this happens, the householder's on the premises, he's phoned up the police, he's distressed, and so on. We didn't have that. There was one last factor in Martin's court case which swung the jury against him. You should appreciate that normally, when a householder finds himself in this situation, that he's very emotional, he's very upset by what's happened. He, he'll be remorseful, even though he may have been entirely innocent in the situation. Tony Martin was very defensive, not emotional. So he would have come over to the jury probably as a rather unemotional, hard person. I'm sorry, I, you couldn't possibly um, be remorseful for something that you didn't mean to do. And you would then go down the road of saying that you're remorseful, then that means basically you're responsible for the actions of other people. And to me, that's anarchy. I've expressed that view before. Um, I know the young man has lost his life. He has a family, and I understand that. But um, maybe they lost control of him. But actually, I don't really want to go into and judge that family. <laughs> Or this boy, they have their lives to lead, and we have ours. And people have got to appreciate, have got to respect decent people. Brendan Fearon was sentenced to three years for conspiracy to burgle Bleak House, while accomplice Darren Bark received two and a half years. Tony Martin was sentenced to life for the murder of Fred Barris. In October 2001, Martin successfully appealed the conviction after a psychologist diagnosed that he'd been suffering from paranoia. The charge was reduced to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, and he was released from prison in July 2003. Him getting long life welfare is a uh, could he have killed somebody, regardless, say. Uh, Hey, what spin you put on it? He has, he has killed somebody. Hey, I've got remorse for me taking him, which I think about that every night when I sleep and what have you, and what would you grow up like? And when I see people, I think, oh, I look like Fred, he's the same man, I look like Fred, and whatever. So I've got that remorse. He's got no remorse whatsoever for his actions, his, his talk. When you're a law abiding person, you're minding your own business, whether you're in your workshop, workplace, or whether you're in your house, the unexpected, somebody comes along, um, for whatever the reasons are, that there's confrontation. Basically, whatever you do, you should protect in law against that, because you don't know what you are going to do. And things, things happen on the spur of the moment, they're instinctive. And I'm afraid the law as it stands when it comes to householders, it's flawed. Anybody can see that. Martin's case led to a private member's bill which proposed raising the threshold for prosecuting householders from reasonable force to grossly disproportionate force. But the bill has since been abandoned. Uh, the Tony Martin case has got a lot of publicity. It, it's called questions to be asked, speeches to be made. Uh, it's been discussed in Parliament, discussed amongst lawyers. When, quite frankly, it doesn't justify that because the Tony Martin case was totally exceptional for lots of reasons. The evidence against him, the gun he was using, how did he get it? He said he found it in the back of his car. He'd fired into the dark without any warning at all. Afterwards, he had hidden himself, hidden his gun. 
They were very unusual features, they're not a typical case at all. The, the typical case is quite different. And that's how you should judge whether or not you need to change the law. Because even if you change the law, it's quite probable that a jury would find Tony Martin guilty. I mean, if you look at the law in its seriousness, um, there are circumstances where using a shotgun within your house would be quite lawful. If you've got somebody similarly armed coming at you saying, I'm going to do you, or whatever terminology they use, if you shoot them, no judge and jury in this country is going to convict you. You're actually carrying out the lawful act within the law as it stands. So we don't need to be frightened as long as we don't become the aggressor. And I think that's really the lesson that comes out of it. Many people ask me, Tony, if you, would you do the same thing again? And I've always told people in the same position I'd do the same thing again because there's this overriding thing in your nature is to survive. And then somebody will come along, a policeman will say, well, burglars don't want trouble, they don't want to kill people. Well, I say, if you don't want trouble, keep out of somebody's house, keep out of somebody's yard. Now 60 years old, Tony Martin continues to live at Bleak House. People have their houses broken into and they don't want to live in the house anymore. They move on, they go somewhere else. But Tony's staying. This is my farm, this is my home. I think the house has been there since about 1870. My family have been there since 1870. I'm afraid it's past its best, but I hang on to it. The orchard was probably planted before the First World War. It's got walnut trees and um, it's got an old oak tree. Some people come along and say the place is a mess. Other people think it's um, tranquility. some very nice times down there but there's no doubt about it times have changed and um, some people say well if you're having all these problems uh, why don't you leave and go somewhere else uh, I don't see it like that why should you have to um, why should you have to go somewhere else whether it's because I'm English or whatever it is I don't know but um, we hold our ground I mean is that wrong is that wrong? Thank you.